Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you find me here, sitting in silence, listening carefully for the alarm calls of potentially alarming birds, impala, kudu, any other potential lion prey species. You are with Wild Earth. If you've managed to stumble upon this website by mistake, welcome to it. Don't change just yet. You're uh, in for something special, we hope. Uh, if you're a regular viewer, thank you for being with us. My name is James. On camera behind me, I have Andrew uh, Bandito uh, Francis. Andrew Bandito Francis. On the other vehicle, we've got Brent and... Who's with Brent, Andrew? Vium. And Vium, uh, the wildebeest. Uh, and in the control room, we have Tara and Brian making sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible. It's a balmy 23 degrees or 63 uh, centigrade or 63 Fahrenheit. And I'm sitting here just where we found the Nkohuma Pride this morning. And for those of you who don't know, the Nkohuma Pride is seven lions and a young lion, uh, or seven lionesses uh, and a young lion uh, of about three years old. And they were in this area this morning, and they were unsettled, not particularly happy. And what I found out subsequent to the drive was that they had been feeding on a buffalo carcass south of the reserve, where the two big males of the area were. And I suspect that they've been chased away from that area, possibly by the resident pride that side, which is called the Styx Pride, and that's why they ended up over here. We left them just inside there, off in the bush, resting up, and when we left them to go and have a look at the hyena den and came back, they were nowhere to be seen. Now, I have pretty much driven this entire block around the, uh, the, on the roads that surround this particular piece of bush, and I haven't found anything in the way of very fresh tracks. So we're going to do that again. Um, we might, ne might necessitate a bit of bundu bashing at some stage, but my goal today is to try and re-find that pride of lions. Um, and Brent, I think, is going off to the east to see if he can find some cheetah uh, and perhaps just check if these, this, these lions haven't moved. It's not a hot day, and so the lions could move, especially if they're feeling pressure from the south. Um, they're right on the edge of their territory as far as I understand their territorial movements. So that's the plan this afternoon. Welcome to it. It's great to have you along. If you've got any questions or comments, we love to hear from you. Don't be shy to send them through. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. And while it is a Sunday afternoon for you, wherever you happen to be watching this on the World Wide Web, this day feels very much like any other to Andrew and I and I suspect to the lions as well. They don't tend to stick to weekend routine at all. So we're going to carry on past the waterhole and then circumnavigate this block and see if we can't pick up some lion tracks. And with any luck, the lions on the end of those tracks. Here we go. There are some old tracks going down this way and it will pay us, I think, to just have a quick look at the water hole first. And then maybe do another sort of loop around the block. It's possible they've walked off and actually crossed out of the reserve, but I I don't think they would have done that. Anyway, it's a lovely afternoon. The normally fairly uh, garish light of this time of the year uh, filtered by some beautiful heavy clouds but thankfully not so heavy that we're not getting any sunlight there was a warthog at the water hole when we checked it earlier which is normally a fairly poor indication that lions are around unless he's about to die of course And of course, this time of the year, if you're a lion, you're exactly the right color because if 
you've never seen a lion before, uh, the colors you're seeing in the grass around you, that's, what a that's the color of a lion. I see no tracks over here. So we're going to do a little U-turn and then head up off to the southwest. Just make sure we haven't missed anything here. Like I say, Sundays to them are not days for rest at the waterhole. Date for the afternoon, and he's got a stork, I believe, some sort of tallish bird, um, and we'll see you just now. Good afternoon and welcome on the Sunset Safari. My name is Brent and I have Vian the Wildebeest on camera. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm sure you've had uh, James done the rest of the introductions for me. Uh, welcome on the Sunset Safari. We're just at Twin Dams at the moment. There's a group of buffalo bulls. I'm quite sure these might be part of the group that were being harassed by the lions last night. So we could hear them bellowing. One is looking very comfortable in the mud there. And about to have a roll. So, as the crow flies, oh look at that, right onto his back. Oh, getting a good mud caking. Try to deal with some of those irritating ectoparasites. There we go. I'm also caking his horns in mud. I think that's a byproduct of trying to roll onto his back and cover as much of his body as possible with mud. And as you can see there, he is completely drrr covered. You're a big boy. And the other buffalo to the right is in a very feeler like pose. Um, and quite often we see lions sleeping like that more often than we see buffalo sleeping like that. And we had a long night being chased around. He almost looks like he is retired permanently, apart from a little bit of movement on the ears there. And there's an old saying in Africa, it's always the sleeping and uh, the dead animal that gets up to kill you. I'm just going to move forward a tiny bit because there's another really nice bird here. Um, and last week Andrew got an incredible shot of one flying in and out of the sun and more than likely it will be one of these two uh, I think it's the pair we see quite regularly on the Juma cam so I'm going to just pop across to it now there we go Saddle build stalk. Both are actually here. The other is behind the tree to the left of that one we're looking at now. Beautiful animals. And you can hear, I don't know if you guys can hear that in the in the background that's <laughs> Um, it actually sounds like dwarf mongoose alarm calling at the saddlebolt stalk. A saddlebolt stalk would feel nothing at wolfing down a little mongoose if given the opportunity. Probably not their usual prey, but would definitely, if they had the opportunity, take that and eat a dwarf mongoose. So I can hear the dwarf mongoose alarm calling quite a lot. Okay, apparently you guys can't hear it, it's a little bit far. Um, I might go a little bit closer, see if we can hear it. But, 
I got a, a whisper, a report during the day uh, that has sent me down to these southeastern parts. Um, and there's a special animal that might possibly cross into our traverse area. I'm definitely going to go have a look for the tracks um, when I get down there. And I'm not going to tell you what the animal is. What I might do a little later, not now, is give you the Shangan name of the animal and see if you guys can figure it out from that. And it is a, a just a whisper of a chance, so don't get too excited. Also, it might pay to check that those dwarf mongoose are, in fact, alarm calling at the Saddlebolt Stalk. I'm pretty sure they are. Um, but you never know, there might be a leopard lying watching the buffalo bask in the sun. And these saddlebolt stalks getting very relaxed with our presence. there we might be close enough to hear those mongoose alarm calls now. You getting the alarm calls? There we go. Can you hear that? And judging from where that alarm call is coming from, I'm pretty sure that those dwarf mongoose are alarming at that, those saddlebolt stalk. And yeah, there's quite a few of them around. and it's possible that she's just lost her signal. She's a remarkably recalcitrant old old bird. Um, so, a <laughs> couple of technical hitches there. Uh, <laughs> uh, Wendy, Wendy had an issue, and then we had an issue, um, but we are back now. I'm still tracking the lions. Not sure what happened to Wendy. Uh, we'll have a talk to her later. We have just circumnavigating the same block just to see if the tracks haven't come out and we've nearly done that since we last saw us and no tracks yet so we're going to have to probably mash our way in there again and just see if we can't find out where on earth they've gone I'm going to turn off here and just give a listen. That's the, that bird that you can hear there. It's called a long-billed crumbeck. Tiny little bird with no tail. And what it's doing is it's alarm calling at something. But I suspect quite strongly that we'd be able to see if it was alarm calling at the lions. So it could be a snake. It could be a bird of prey that's somewhere in the trees here. A little one, like an occipiter, some sort of occipiter, goshawk. I'm just going to go a little bit back in case we've managed to miss the carpet of seven Kohuma Pride members. But I can't see anything in there. Like I say, they are the perfect, perfect color for this time of the year. So I'd be looking for their coats. I'd be looking for the flick of that little black pom-pom on the end of the tail. 
or the black on the back of the ears or the terrified look on the faces of an impala perhaps Hello Jess in Manchester, the United Kingdom. I hope you're having a fine summer's day out there. Uh, and w we are having a magnificent time, uh, winter's day where we are. You want to know why it is that lions have a bush on the end of their tails? Um, it leads on to, the simple answer is that it's a following mechanism. So uh, they are able to follow that little black bobble when they're following each other on the hunt or when cubs are following their mums. And the more complicated answer or slightly more complicated answer is why, why is it like that when the other cats don't have it? Well, the other cats, of course, are not, commu are not um, cooperative hunters. So that would be one reason. The other reason is that the other cats already have black in some of their coloring so a leopard or a cheetah for example have black spots and apparently the they've got white on their tails because it's a nice juxtaposition between the black spots um, and whereas the black on the end of a lion's tail is uh, quite a quite e easily seen because of their color if that makes sense to you they also use it just like a house cat to indicate when they're angry so when your house cat's about to pounce you can see them flapping their tails like that and the lion will crouch down just like that and flick that tail from side to side and if you happen to be on foot in the area uh, it'll be accompanied with a throaty roar or growl that will leave you cold from the tips of your toes to the tip of your head and all the way down your fingers So, nothing so far. So we're going to go back down to the water hole and then head up the drainage line that feeds it. Right, here we are at the water hole. Now, of course, on a hot summer's day, in fact, and we had this, an incidence of this with this very pride at another water hole a little while back. It was very hot, it was much hotter than it is now. And so the lions may well have come down to the water to drink and then remained close by. They don't seem to have done that today. So they were found just up here or well, I left them just up here disappeared for two seconds and the so-and-so's moved off somewhere so you have to excuse the wobbly uh, picture we're not in fact on a road anymore at all makes things a little difficult for Andrew El Bandito just watch the aerial here Andrew put your teeth everyone All right we're just going to fix the uh, fix the aerial go it's on fire is the bandit so they were lying off to the right this morning and where they've gone from there is difficult to say 
not easy to track them in the when there's grass. And they've also been walking up and down this area all the time. So it's a little tricky. I'm going to follow a little bit more up this drainage line and see if they aren't around here. Likely they will be in the shade somewhere. So keep a lookout in the shade. Um, while I'm driving along, I did a bit of reading in the off time during the middle of the day. And because there are lots of sort of... Uh, legends and things that go around about for example like the one i gave you about why lions have got black on their tails and the backs of their ears and there's a lot of talk about why lions have manes and a lot of people ask what is the point of a mane and what's the function and where does it how, you know what's the difference between a dark mane and a blonde mane and what does that mean so i'd love to know from you as a by way of interactive quiz if you were to guess, what is the one function, major function, of a lion's mane, what would it be? I mean, there are a few answers, but try and stick away from Google. Just think carefully to yourself, what could the function of a lion's mane be? And there, no, there are no stupid suggestions. The most, sometimes the most way out lead to the most viable answer. So, see what you can come up with, and let me know. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv and then I'll tell you what I think it is which may be total rubbish but I'll give you my idea I believe the Land Rover Defender 90 is a made of stern stuff probably more likely down in the drainage line to the left so we'll head that way teeth Andrew a number of flies would suggest that they must be around somewhere Can I have a listen? Sue in North Carolina, you've got a question. Um, I didn't quite hear it on the radio, so we'll just wait for it to come through again, and I promise I will answer it, answer it for you. Sue, um, you, while we are bungling around looking for these recalcitrant cats, you would like to know, have I come across many snakes during my time in the bush? Um, the answer is yes, many, many snakes, uh, half adders, spitting cobras, black mumbers, boom slung or tree snakes, vine snakes, Snouted cobras, olive bush snakes, olive grass snakes, sorry, spotted bush, green bush snakes, all manner of snakes, too. And you know what? None of them has ever attacked me. And a lot of people think that coming to a wild area like this must be like stepping into a nest of proverbial vipers. And it simply isn't. You know, the snakes out here, watch out, Andrew. I'm just about to take Andrew's face. You must see the athletic feet he's just pulled off with his foot. That is astonishing. Um, so, Sue, 
there are lots of snakes out here, but they are generally far more afraid of us than we are of them. So while, excuse us there. So while there are quite a few of them around, I'm just gonna stop here again and have a quick listen. So while there are quite a few snakes around, Sue, um, we seldom actually see them uh, in close proximity. We do find the odd spitting cobra in and about the, the... They tend to like buildings, but they're pretty slow and they're quite easy to catch if you know what you're doing. Just remember, all snakes would far rather... Oh, that's a rock. Would far rather move away than bite you. And the reason for that, and it's important, is a snake... It's very expensive for a snake's body to produce the venom that they do. The molecules are extremely complicated. Uh, uh, venom is a very complicated protein. And so they make it in very small amounts. It's very potent. But so for them to bite you, it's a waste. They, they're never going to try and eat a human being. And so they only bite in defense if they can't move away. And so that's the only reason people get bitten. It's not because snakes are aggressive at all. They'd far rather use the venom to bite something that um, they could eat. Can't hear anything at the moment. We will carry on. So we've had lots of answers to our main question. Um, and some of the names I have are Gemma, John Boy, Lynn, and Jill. Ooh. Yeah, no, this is not good. We're not gonna get through here. And many others. We're not gonna get through this particular area here. In fact, <laughs> Andrew, I may have got us stuck. Uh, I'm going to get, get to the. I'm going to get to this uh, main discussion now. So most of you said. Right, and then we have Dennis in Massachusetts who's also said that he's heard that 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 the um, he's done some research that shows black-maned lions we're not, not going to get through that hole either that black-maned lions have a, a better chance of breeding than paler-maned lions so the general consensus was that it's for the protection of the, of the head during fights and that the bigger mane makes them look a bit bigger and then the other consensus was yer. <laughs> <laughs> the other consensus was that it had something to do this is a dead tree Andrew don't worry it had something to do with attracting mates Right, I'm going to extract my stuff on. I'm going to wear these lines off. Right. Andrew, let's take a breather. I feel quite exhausted. I'm also covered in masses of foliage. <laughs> Andrew, beneath his bandito uh, mask, has gone quite pale. Um, so... What I read today is that 
yes, there's a lot of discussion around lion manes being effectively used for, um, to protect the neck, except that all cats fight in a very similar way. And, you know, the females fight almost as much as the males at times, and they don't seem to um, get any more damage around the neck than the males do. Uh, so it's looking like that's unlikely. So I read about a study where they took two big models of a lion, of lions, sort of stuffed, stuffed models, one with a blonde mane and one with a black mane, and they put them in a wild area and they called lions in with, a, with hyenas, basically. Anyway, the lions came along and the lionesses were more attracted or made, uh, were, were more encouraged to approach the blonde lion. Um, and they reckoned that was because they felt more comfortable, like it, because there was a strange lion, it wasn't going to attack them or be aggressive. The black mane is definitely associated with increased testosterone um, and a greater fitness. Now, the question, as with all questions in biology, is why? So, let's have another little quiz while we drive around here looking for the lions. Let's accept that the, it's got something to do with mate selection, um, that the black mane is an indicator of testosterone, but why the mane? What's it for? Why, why does something like that develop on an animal? So let's, let's forget about the fighting for now. I suspect that the protection that it affords during fighting is probably a secondary thing, and it's got something to do with attracting mates. Why does that happen? Why not have a, I don't know, a, 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 pink, a left, pink left ear or something like that? Why this, why this mane? Let's give that a bit of thought, and if you can come up with any answers, that'd be great. I'm going to press on slightly through this bush and see if we can't find something with a mane to show you. Andrew, it's getting pretty thick in here. Mm -hmm. Mind going off on foot for a while? We might have to, at some stage. Tell me my eyes are not deceiving me. I think they are. Just going to have a look there. I see what looks like it could be the shiny white belly of a lion. It is in fact the shiny white side of a fallen marula log. It's a bit sad. Sorry about that. They're probably lying in deep shade somewhere at this stage of the game. It's possible that they moved away so far that, you know, I have missed the tracks and quite quickly because of the pressure that they were feeling from the south. It doesn't make a great deal of sense to me that they would have done that. They were all full. done a full trip through this block and come up empty handed and eyed well we keep up the search okay so while we drive along the And we're just going to head across to Brent now while we continue to bash around in here. Um, and we'll see you just now, hopefully with a bit more luck. Welcome back everyone, um, we are still in search of this mystery animal, I'm driving very slowly, I don't want to miss a track, uh, and it is an animal, so a single animal, not a group, not two, not three, but one, and I'm still not going to let you know what it is just yet, um, I think if we have no tracks by the time I get uh, to the end of the eastern boundary, I'll give you a Shangan name. 
and then see if you can work it out from there. B. Wilson, welcome on the Sunset Safari. Um, B would like to know what they look quite far away from the water. Is this uh, unusual? Uh, at this time of the year, not. They will forage in the in the grasslands and that around the around the water. So it just depends. It's not that unusual. And then um, Valerie would like to know uh, how tall a saddlewood stalk is compared to me okay well I'm gonna have to jump out of the vehicle for this Valerie and Lynn would like to know how tall the side of wood stalk is compared to me I think you guys just want me to get out of the car okay so a side of wood stalk probably would stand at my shoulder so it's almost it could even be taller than James um, so a side of wood stalk very very tall bird um, a while around 170 centimeters if I remember correctly 175 um, so even actually a bit taller so quite a, an incredibly tall bird now let's get back on the hunt for the mystery animal the wildebeest is scanning the bush intently I'm scanning for tracks intently and um, fingers crossed we find a track, or even better, we find an animal. D from Connecticut. Sorry, I started answering your question, and um, the gremlin got involved uh, about where do saddlewood stalks nest. Um, they nest in big stick platforms in the trees. Uh, you'll find very few or if any of the, the, the large storks um, and herons uh, nest on the ground. Almost all of them are arboreal nesters. They do make very big messy nests. Come on, come on. So if this mystery animal hasn't crossed the eastern boundary, um, I'm going to go chase shadows again. For those of you who might not have been on the Sunrise Safari, um, we had a brief view of shadow uh, until she turned into a shadow and left us oh, in, the, in the dark, so to speak. And we struggled to try to find her again, but I will check if she has come out of that, but it is worth looking for this mystery animal first. So here we have a pair of sand grouse, the double banded sand grouse. F fascinating birds. Uh, I do really love their call. For me, it sounds like an old 1980s sort of computer that the Bond villain's using. I'll try to see, I might have it here. Um, but a really fascinating little bird. So they quite often nest incredible distances from water and they will fly uh, to a water hole and collect water in their breast feathers and take them back for the chicks so a really really neat little adaption there um, and also in areas where you have multiple sand grass species of uh, unfortunately we've only got one here but in northern Botswana they have uh, different times um, to drink so quite interesting the let me just remember this the yellow throated sand grass will drink at um at about four o'clock in the morning um your then your your double bandits will either drink at sunrise or sunset and your birchels um will drink around midday and then the last but definitely not the least the namaqua 
drinks at about midnight. So they try a fact that they're not all trying to drink at the same time. And in those areas uh, of Botswana and that on the edge of the desert where there is water, you can get up to 100,000 sand grass coming to drink out of one pan in the evening. It is actually quite a spectacular uh, scene. Also, quite interesting, a lot of the old little carnivals specialize in them. So you've got African wildcats and jackals, black back jackals, will actually leap and grab them out of the air. So they have meandered off a little bit. Just quickly see if I can find them. I might not have their call. No, I don't, unfortunately. Okay, well, keep moving on. I forgot to load the Southern African birds. I've got Central and West African birds on there at the moment. There is quite a lot of crossover, but not these guys. So the male is the one on the left and he's what the, they're named after. If you have a look on his nose, there's a little double band, a black and white band. Very, very cool birds. Incredibly fast flying. And from a size reference, um, for you guys, it's they're probably about the same size as a feral pigeon or a rock pigeon, the same one that occurs in cities throughout the world. You see, sometimes if you go past them, um, they go down to the grass and keep still. And they are actually very beautiful when you get close to them. Although he looks like he's about to fly. I stopped. So there we go. Really pretty bird. Nice yellow eye, and you can definitely see that double band there. And then he's also got another double band on his chest. But he's not really helping us. I'm going to try and sneak past him, see if he believes me that I'm not going to stop. Oh, unfortunately, they took off. Well, that was a really nice little stopover with the sand grass. Um, I really love those birds. Come on, mystery animal track. This animal is so mysterious, not even VM knows what it is. Sorry, I thought I heard something there for a second. This is not looking too favorable. I'm getting towards the end of the eastern boundary and I haven't seen any tracks yet. Come on, mystery animal. It's Father's Day. You have to be nice. And on that note, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. It is also solstice. So it is the shortest day of the year for us here. Yeah? So obviously being a Sunday, um, for our regular viewers, you all know it's Fireside Chat. If you a new viewer, you might not. So for the last half an hour of the drive, um, James and I will try to be as entertaining as possible while sitting around a, uh, a fire. We'll discuss what's happened during the week. And we've got a couple of topics we'd like you to send some questions in on. Um, and, and, and so we can get, get going on that now. Um, the one topic is definitely my highlight of the week, which was that those two male cheetah that got chased by the quarantine leopard. So if you guys have any uh, questions related to that sighting or cheetah, please send them through now. Um, also, uh, from James, uh, that incredible sighting of the honey badger and kit 
uh, and them feeding on something. So if you have any uh, questions about that, uh, please send them through. And you do that by emailing questions at wilder.tv uh, uh, or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And of course, James will be entertaining uh, again in the last little bit with a song. Uh, and he might have made a very big mistake because he let me loose with and I don't know if you could go as far as to call it a musical instrument but he felt I, I wasn't competing enough and uh, I, or, or helping him out enough doing those things so we'll see whether he made a terrible mistake letting me uh, loose with something that makes noise because I have very very little um, musical talent I'm afraid okay so we are coming unfortunately to the end of the eastern boundary So on Father's Day, um, we, animal species are obviously quite different fathers to us, um, but who, we're going to ask a question, which we're only going to answer at Fireside Chat, who is the best father that we see regularly, um, and what is it, is it a bird, is it an animal? Um, so who is the best father that we see regularly? Remember to send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So very interesting and let's see who's going to be able to figure that out. So unfortunately, we haven't found those tracks, unfortunately, of the mystery animals. So, we're sitting here now and we've reached our northern boundary and there are no tracks coming out. So I'm going to give you the Shangan word for what this animal is and see if you guys can figure out what the English is and of course bonus points for the Latin. So the Shangan name is uh, it is Shikankanka. So the Shangan name is Shikankanka. Uh, what animal have I been searching for? What is the English name of the mystery animal? The Shangan name, one more time Shikankanka. And you can send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. And back to that. So the fireside quiz father's day question what is the best father in this area uh, is it a bird is it an insect is it possibly a reptile uh, or is it a mammal or is it something completely different so we will answer that when at fireside chat and I do feel I've said the Twitter address and the email address enough times in the last few seconds so I'm sure you guys have got it. Ah, so it seems that Commander Bond has been sabotaging me. Uh, his, I'll have to deal with him and his nefarious ways at the fireside, but so we were looking, in fact, for a cheetah. This time it was a single cheetah. I'm not sure whether it was a male or female. I just got a report that one was seen to the east of us and might be heading towards that eastern boundary. So now, when in doubt, to Buffalo Dam. Feel like I haven't visited Bob for a while. Oh. Don't disappear too quickly. There's some warthog. They are very fast warthog. Let's see if we can get a bit closer. And we can see 
following on from our conversation this morning about the following mechanisms an animal that nice extent tail now hang on sorry guys it's gonna grab my other radio, my game drive radio for a second sorry last station go again copy i'm on the bufflesook boundary i can be there quite quickly Oh, thanks very much, James. So, I just um, heard from James over the radio that apparently there's quite a lot of alarm calling around uh, Vuyatilla Dam in the Juma camp. So, guys, zoomies, keep a lookout. Uh, and if you can give me an update before I get there, that'll be great. So, we're going to try to zoom into that area because we're close to the, the boundary. It will give us an opportunity to use this big road to, to get down to there quite quickly. that it seems it seems like it was a false alarm at Vuya Vuya Tela Dam at the Juma Cam. It sounds like uh, someone got a little bit excited over some late impala ratting and uh, thinking it was alarm calls. So we're back down to Sedate, no more Ferrari Safari uh, and we'll go down and check on Bob Well done, Tanya, and you got that Shikankanka is the cheater. She was the first. I think there might have been a bit of naughty cheating there with uh, Jamesy. Um, but uh, she also got the Latin, the Asionix jubilatus. And if you remember, we were discussing the Latin name of a cheater not that long ago. Uh, and Asionix is a breakup of two Greek words. Um, one that means thorn and the other that means claw. And that's probably because of the non-retractable claws. They cannot fully retract their claws like uh, lions and leopards. So, who wants to put money on whether Bob's got a girl or Bob's still alone? Or whether there's a hummocorp or a heron on Bob's back? I think we'll find out shortly. At least Bob's not like Nigel No Friends, as Andrew calls the dikers every time we see them. Bob's at least got the heron and the hummercorp to keep them company from time to time. So guys, I'm about to go through a, a little dip. There might be a, a break up in signal, so just bear with me for a second. There we go. Through and hopefully an uneventful crossing so we have a quick look in this area and then we're gonna head back to that area where we had those brief sighting of shadow uh, this morning and see if we can find any tracks there but there was no chance I wasn't following up on the possibility of a cheetah. Tax, I uh, just 
spoke to the last vehicle that was uh, with that animal this morning. Apparently it was left on a rhino cut line junction with the fire break lying up. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry, the Gary main uh, fire break. Wow, this is the first time. So before we show, let's have a little question, see very quickly. Who thinks Bob's by himself? Or has Bob got a friend? Or even a girlfriend? Ginny thinks he's with a heron, but Bob is with another hippo. And you can see there's a, a very distinct scar on the oh I actually don't think this is Bob um let me have a closer look or maybe the one closest to us might not be Bob unless Bob's been in a big fight obviously when the hippos are like that they can be very difficult to, for, for us to sex um but I th do think it is one is possibly Bob. But whether it's a girlfriend or a friend, who knows? And there's some kudu walking behind. And I think they just finished their drink when we arrived, or they might go have a drink in that other corner as well where it's a bit shallower and after sorry I'm just listening to the game drive you sound a bit out of breath there James So, 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 James sounds a little bit out of breath. I think he's actually had to do uh, a bit of walking, and I think that's just justice for him giving away my the answer to my question. And see, behind the hippos is a white-breasted cormorant, uh, just magnificent light at the moment as well. And if we come out, see the blue of the sky and the water, which is actually quite filthy, looks quite serene and clean from this angle with this amazing sky. And you can see sort of some remnants of a cold front. And isn't that a beautiful picture? Bob's got a friend. The sun is shining. James is out of breath. But I wonder what caused James to be out of breath. Hmm. Maybe he's actually had to do some work today. There's a... Just trying to have a look at these hippos, you can see there's a, I can see a scar on the one closest to us. And he's got quite a few scars on his head as well. Oh, and Nyala as well. Well spotted for him. So I've just been looking at this hippo. So I don't know if that's Bob or if Bob has been in a box. So you can see he's definitely there's a scar on the back and some scars on the face that the ones on the face look more fresh so from a more recent fight and we did hear that incredible fight Judy would like to know whether it was Bob we saw mating a few weeks ago uh, very unlikely uh, Judy we saw that as mating hippos at Arethusa Dam which is probably in our Travis area, Buffalo Sook Dam and Arethusa Dam are really far apart. 
So that was the dominant male hippo from Arethusa Dam. And now we've got an Anyala walking up to the cormorant. So actually you might stop for a drink. Nope. And that's quite often why those animals will walk around to that little inlet where it's shallower. Instinct tells them that there's a possibility of crocodiles always. So they'll try to go to the area to drink where there's least, less likely anything to happen. I'm just going to move forward a little bit. Have a look at what those kudu were looking at. Suddenly they looked like they were a little bit... No, I just got a little spook. Here we go. And Yal is about to drink now. Very pretty. Isn't this a very serene picture? It's taking a nice snapshot. Very, very pretty. Sky and the colors. Uh, I think it's this cold front and it's kept a little bit of the dust down this afternoon so it's a much crisper afternoon a little bit chilly but very very beautiful there's the white breasted cormorant probably feeding on little tilapia and minnow species as well as small catfish species but oh just behind us fam We've got another group of Inyala. This time they have a little baby with them. Hi, Jeannie. Uh, Jeannie would like to know whether you get any loons uh, near or Juma. Uh, Jeannie, I, as far as I know, there, we don't have any loons in Southern Africa uh, at all. I think a loon is related to the cormorants, but I'm not 100% sure. Here we are See what I was talking about, how these Nyala have chose to come to where it's very shallow and there's almost a zero chance of them being caught by a crocodile. It's always amazing to just sit and just take in a vista like this for a second and it makes us realize what a wonderful place we live in. Very, very lucky to live in the bush. So I think we'll leave the residents of Buffles Hook Dam. We'll have one more look at who's around. Okay. Well, let's leave the cormorant who's drying its wings. Bob and Bob's mate and the Inyala who have finished drinking are moving off and we're gonna follow the Inyala and move along and we'll head back into that area where we saw shadow this morning and see if we can 
find some sign of it. There you go, the Nyala, after leaving the water, they're having a drink, heading back into the bush. Pamela, welcome on the Sunset Safari. Lovely to have you on the back of a vehicle with us. Um, Pamela would like to know, is it true that cheetahs can't turn very well uh, when running? Well, Pamela, it completely depends on how, what type of running they're doing. Um, when they are running at full speed, which is over 100 kilometers an hour, um, they're baffled to turn because of the speed they're going. But if they are going slower, the turning capabilities are very agile. Not quite as agile as a leopard, but probably not too far off what a lion's agility is. But it's when they're running at that full speed. Uh, and that's why you'll notice animals like Impala and the gazelles are able to do those sharp turns. And they will do quite a few of them um, to try avoid um, being eaten. And uh, so it's quite interesting and that's why the cheetah will often have to do a much longer round to try to keep up with the, the prey species. But I've just heard uh, why James was out of breath and walking. I was secretly hoping um, he, the lions were going to catch him while he was in the bush, but unlikely not. He just found them. So we're going to cross back across to James and we'll be back with you a little bit later. Welcome back to Jiga everybody. Uh, I greet you with the news that we have found the lions and we're just going to take the vehicle through and see. Um, I have just spotted them um, and you might just be able to see them in front of us there. The last hopefully bit of bush bashing we'll have to do today. It's going to be quite substantial bush bashing that will hopefully not destroy Andrew. Right. Hold on, everybody. Right. There they are in front of us. And there we go. what to have a I'm very pleased we got in here because it is a very thick are there more lions there Andrew I'm gonna stop here for now until we've got a better idea and I just need to quickly tell one of these game drives where to go Diana Everybody, that was quite something. So the whole pride is here. We can see a youngster, that's Junior, the male just in front of us. There's a 
a female to my right and just through Andrew, I don't know if you can see those ones through in front of us there. Yeah, if you just zoom in there at the top of my bonds, you should be able to get a slight view of them there. There, you can see that bit of tawny at the bottom of your screen is them. I'm going to sneak slowly forward. And, I mean, like I say, it's very thick, so we don't want to disturb them too much. I dread to think what the bottom of this vehicle must look like after what I put it through today. Can you get Junior there? Yeah. Right. Are we going to settle here for a little while? And, yeah. So, everybody, I saw them on foot first. Uh, came walking through here very stealthily with a stick. And they saw me, and this is a classic thing that people don't understand. They saw, they picked me up from probably 200 meters off. That's why it took me so long to get in here in the car. Um, stood up, looked, and ran. There's a youngster coming in. So they're not, they really don't see us as prey at all. They see us as predators. Even little old me. So we've had a few more answers on our um, on our um, main story, and we're just going to have a quick discussion on it now. Um, Junior, as you can see there, has got a fairly uh, a putrid little excuse for a beard, a bit like Andrew's versus mine, actually. No, sorry, Andrew's got quite a nice beard, a bit like Brent's versus mine. Um, but we have beards for different reasons. I'm going to give you my little theory to, as to why they have uh, manes. And I read it today from some research. And the easiest uh, um, thing to liken it to is a peacock's tail. Now, a peacock's tail confers no advantage on the peacock whatsoever. But as um, what it does do is it, it, it creates actually a disadvantage for the male. So if that male can survive with a tail that long, what it means is that he's, he's, um, he's almost compensating for it and he's so powerful that he can deal with such a hindrance. Um, and that's, they reckon, the reason that the peacock has developed the tail, a longer and longer tail. So female peacocks select for longer and longer tails um, because it shows that the males are stronger and stronger. Now, they reckon that this, there's a similar thing. It's, it's a principle called sexual selection. It's a similar thing with lions and their manes. A big black mane is indicative of testosterone and aggression and power and... Well, I mean, testosterone equals aggression, basically. And so that's what that does. And then, so what the females do is, that black mane actually, they've found, um, creates uh, a, an increase in heat in the lion. It's a disadvantage. It's not an advantage to have a great big black mane in the open savannas of East Africa, for example. And that black mane substantially raises the temperature of the lion. Um, when, in times of heat stress, uh, black maned lions have uh, far more errors apparently in their sperm cells because of the temperature and so it's not necessarily an advantage but if you've got a big black mane and you can get through that what it means is that you've got very strong genes your parasite resistance is good your ability to resist disease is good your ability to um, get, get away from predators is good because the mane makes them much more obvious it doesn't make them disguise them at all so that's, I reckon, the best advantage. Now, what's so interesting about this is that as climate change has changed the temperature of the world, so, and not even by that much, say, I think we're pushing up towards 1.2 degrees, I think, the occurrence of black-maned lions in East Africa and the Serengeti 
has started to decline. Isn't that amazing? So with a junior, we'll have a black mane like the one of the Matimbas or a ginger mane like his, uh, like his uh, brother. I don't mean junior's brother, I mean the Matimba brother. Uh, I don't know. And it's also interesting to note that big black mane lions do lose that black color um, and lose hair when they are sick. So it is an indicator of condition. So that's the... That's the tree ties on mains for the day. So not particularly entertaining these fellows at the moment, but at least we found them. I have to tell you, it's a tremendous rush to find a pride of lions on foot. When you're five foot eight and weigh, six, weigh 68 kilograms, to find seven lions on your own and have them run away from you makes you feel like a god. I'd love to tell you that we could reposition to get a better view, but um, <laughs> without, without, a, without a bulldozer, that's not going to be possible. There's old Junior having a look at us. Junior, I hope you get a decent sized mane, my boy. Can you see anything? Okay. I can't move, I'm afraid. Barring, uh, in the absence of a bulldozer, I can't go anywhere. <laughs> so there are two other game drives full of students who've come from, I think they're all from the States, actually. And these are the first lions they've seen. So they're extremely excited probably expecting them to do something spectacular other than lie on the ground. So hopefully they will do that a bit later for them. The females are moving around a bit there, Andrew. I'm not sure if you can make your camera zoom straight through this <laughs> Combretum herreroensi tree, one of the uh, most dense woods we find out here. <laughs> I'm afraid that's, that's all we can do for now. I think it's probably worth sitting here for a little longer, you know. Um, they may get up and move. Uh, they may not, of course. They haven't moved very far from where we saw them this morning. But they are a... They're a... They're probably about 400 meters from where we last saw them. So it's probably worth just hanging around for a while. And as the sun dips, they may get up and move. Like I, s you can see um, on the belly of old Junior when Andrew uh, has ceased trying to film through a Combretum herreroensi tree. You'll see that he's definitely eaten. The whole pride ate last night. Not sure what they ate, but like I said earlier, it seems that they probably were just south of us on another reserve, uh, eating on a buffalo, probably with the males. Um, and yeah, they were chased. I, th I think they were chased up onto our reserve by the, because they're right on the southern border of their territory. And I think that the stick pride, one or two of the stick pride, probably chased them up here. And that's possibly why they've, a few of them have got cuts on their noses and on their heads, probably slightly more than is standard at a, fee, at a kill. So it indicates that the males were at the kill um, and possibly also that there was a bit of a scuffle with another pride. So I think that's what happened. I may or may not be correct. Uh, but it's difficult to tell. Let's just have a listen out for what's going on around us. And you'll get a sense. I want you to try...
That noise was Andrew just about falling off the vehicle. He is doing his best in some very trying, trying circumstances. So we're going to be a little bit quiet now. And I want you to try and get a sense of the silence and the sort of peaceful atmosphere that's lulled these lions into complete repose. Well, you can, of course, hear the voice of a Dutch guide behind us. So we might do our little bit of listening a bit later when she stopped explaining a few things. Hello, 